We have entered what some people call a new Cold War. It is certainly a period of much enhanced and increasingly, it appears, existential competition between a network or alliance of free countries and free economies in the world and authoritarian states that have a different vision of how the world should be organized. It would be dangerous enough if those countries, led by the People's Republic of China, simply wanted to perpetuate their own political system and their own economic system and their own military power. But increasingly, uh, we see that China has ambitions for regional and potentially global dominance. I think what we saw in the world is a lot of tension. The end of engagement with China, where nine presidential administrations all supported working closely with China, trying to bend the metal of their Leninist system in some temperate way. And I think we saw that um, uh, microchips lay at the heart of this matter. They are the new currency of the realm of the globe. And that Taiwan, China, and the U.S. all have very large shares in this uh, uh, commons. We thought the time was right to uh, produce a paper, a, a work that we think will uh, will inform the conversation and help policymakers as they res wrestle with the uh, the actions that need to be taken uh, to preserve uh, the access to that industry, but more importantly, the democracy and the and the self uh, uh, governing capabilities of the folks in Taiwan. How Taiwan's future is shaped by its relationship with China and the United States is is hugely important. As we studied that and reviewed it. It came back often to a single issue, and that's the semiconductor technology that is so pivotal to global economic prosperity and security, and which is so pivotal to the success of Taiwan over these last two decades. They are the world's leader in semiconductors. Everything we do of a scientific or commercial, or if it should come to pass, we hope it doesn't, military nature in the world uh, increasingly requires large quantities of semiconductors. And for many of these operations, the more advanced semiconductors, what we call the bleeding edge semiconductors. And if the supply of those could be interrupted, it could cripple our economy. So if we don't have semiconductors, our economy will come to a halt. Our uh, national security could be crippled. Our government operations, our university operations, our research in almost every imaginable domain now could be crippled. Therefore, we cannot allow a potential authoritarian adversary to hold us to ransom in the supply of this most essential and basic of commodities in the modern information economy. You know, when the global economy uh, uh, sort of gathered momentum, it didn't matter where things were made. It didn't matter what the governments of the company, countries where the things were made espoused, what ideologies they espoused. If you could get it cheaper, faster, and not have to keep big inventories, all good. And so, the United States stopped manufacturing microchips. And Taiwan wisely saw an opportunity and they filled the gap. And Taiwan happens to be the place of perhaps the most contentious place in the world uh, other than the Ukraine. And that's why we wrote this report. Taiwan's preeminence in the manufacture of semiconductors, especially at the high-end level, is hugely important for, uh, for the global economy. But the reality is, geopolitical situation being what it is, we don't think that that protects them or insulates them from potential uh, uh, coercion on the part of uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, for example. In an ideal world, you would hope that you know, China would recognize the self-interest in continuing to have this uh, uh, this goose that lays the golden egg in Taiwan. But it's increasingly clear that perhaps the uh, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't know how to effectively take care of geese in in that sense. And I think the geopolitical uh, 
uh, and the personal involvement of uh, Chinese leadership of the Chinese Communist Party as solidified during the recent 20th Party Congress indicates that bringing Taiwan into a uh, more unified position with the uh, uh, the Chinese mainland is now an unarguable and off-stated goal of Xi Jinping, the uh, the Chinese leader. I think what we came to appreciate uh, in the multi-dimensional, multi-sectoral give and take of our working group over 18 months is that we should be very cautious in assuming that there is a silicon shield. We were very deliberate in titling our report the silicon triangle not the silicon shield. That triangle is not a badge of protection for Taiwan's security. I think the notion that Taiwan has a silicon shield uh, does overlook a good deal of ambiguity that Taiwan's possession of all of these uh, high-end chip fabs uh, confers on it. At once, it it, it makes it um, uninteresting for China to attack because they're dependent on it. Everybody's dependent on it. That's the paradox. So are we. But on the other hand, they might have some grandiose notion that by taking Taiwan, they would acquire TSMC and thus a choke point on the entire world, all dependent on TSMC for for leading edge microchips. So it's hard to know how to call this one. We first and foremost want to see uninterrupted, free, open, thriving trade generally and in critical areas of technology. If the United States and Japan and Korea and Australia and Europe are to be successful in ensuring a free flow of this critical technology of semiconductors and in ensuring that Taiwan can chart its own political and democratic future and explore the potential future relationship between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China without compulsion, then we need to ensure secure supply chains. I think that uh, unless there is a, a, a radical change, a course correction by Xi Jinping, in China with the Chinese Communist Party, we are going to ineluctably see a slow but inevitable decoupling uh, in many areas because we simply cannot be reliant on a country for things that are key to both our economy and our national security. Now, you know, we saw something that just happened in Russia that made us wonder, oh my heavens, this is not, not in the script. This could happen in China too. And I urge everybody to remember that even though, in my judgment, the threat levels from China are higher than they used to be, and that poses new risks, things can change. And China has within it the capacity to be very different. But under Xi Jinping, I think it's increasingly unlikely that he will be able to make such a course correction. But we do think a regionalization or one that's based on like-minded societies, what's now called in the in the Washington parlance, friend shoring. Instead of onshoring to the US, we bring it, make sure that it's in friends that represent reliable partners. Much as we attempted to do in our reliance on oil in, in decades past, where we uh, we didn't want necessarily energy independence, but we certainly wanted energy security. And I think that's what we're striving for in, in, uh, in uh, uh, semiconductor security. This This is not a set of recommendations that's calling for um, a fortress America economically. I don't think we were ever at a point, even in the 1930s, when that was really feasible, but we're obviously well beyond that now. Economic isolationism is not possible and it's not desirable. What we need is a trading community of democratic and more or less um, aligned peers or allies or friends. So how do we make this all work, given the constraints we have from a security perspective, and still make it a, a free or freer market uh, 
kind of exposure. So we want the uh, the industry to be, to read this, the policymakers, and that includes at the at the White House. That includes the uh, the State Department. That includes uh, certainly and and primarily congressional action that been such an important part of creating the Chips Act that uh, that we are all. Uh, uh, we're pleased with uh, last year. I think what this report will help people understand is that there are things in the global economy that are a commons where we do depend on each other. And that in this these dependencies, political systems matter. And you can't avoid it. You can't just say, don't talk about ideology, just give me the chips. Don't care where they come from, as long as they're good and cheap and fast. We have to start looking at things in a very different way when countries like Russia and China begin to want to sort of opt out of working in a rules-based order and respect the commons as a place where everybody can get what they need and where things don't get held hostage to other things for political purposes.